This is the FM Gold Channel of All India Radio. In the program News Analysis, now we bring you a discussion on Assembly elections in five states. The participants are Professor Rizwan Kaiser, Jamia Milia Islamia, and K V Prasad, Associate Editor, The Tribune. The Election Commission of India announced dates for five state assemblies, starting from Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Mizoram, and Delhi, and Rajasthan. Four states are very crucial because they are what is essentially known as the Hindi heartland, an area which determines and directs shapes of a lot of Indian politics and also that of the national government that comes to Delhi. And in fact, these five state elections are seen as a curtain raiser, if one may say so, or a last battleground test for major political parties, that is the BJP and the Congress, as also others, before the 2014 general elections. Before we go into the nitty-gritties of the entire election things and how the Election Commission of India wants to get go ahead, Professor Kaiser, how would you look at this coming elections? The national elections is still about six, seven months away. But the impression that is being sought to be given is that, well, this is the semi-final and the final would follow. But I think semi-final has been in the making for a very long while. And people had expected such an announcement uh, to come any time soon, which it did yesterday. And with that comes uh, into effect the moral court. But the problem is that how the BJP and the Congress would fare, as you rightly pointed out, in the Hindi heartland, such as uh, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and Delhi. Mizoram is there, as Congress is there in the power, but then there is no BJP, it is Mizo National Front. So, to look at, uh, you know, these two major contenders in northern uh, India, I think we already know what is going to happen, because already BJP is in two places, Congress is in two places, Congress is still in the third place, that is Mizoram. So, in a way, the scene is equally divided, it will all depend how people respond to the incumbency and anti-incumbency. That is uh, the real test of it. As people say that in Rajasthan, a party is not being returned to office consecutively. So one would expect that the Congress uh, will have to really, you know, tighten its pull-up socks and tighten its uh, boots in order to really be ready for that kind of fight. Because now, given the kind of fight and given the kind of stake and given the kind of involvement in this election, the media houses, which as a matter of fact should not have been there, but we see that very, very proactive media houses, one way or the other, I think it certainly is a buggle which has just been sounded for the final. Uh, if you look at the elections, if I may jog the memory to 2008 general elections in these state assemblies, Congress did very badly in some states. Then again, if you go back to 2003 December, the Congress lost Rajasthan, lost Chhattisgarh, and Delhi, of course, they just they had no problems in Delhi per se. And then, since then, Congress could not retain its ground in Chhattisgarh or Madhya Pradesh. They have had continuous governments. But that gave Congress a big jolt, if one may say so, in 2004, she in the face of uh, politics of in Delhi at the center. You've just said what you've said on this. So let me take you to the other direction. Delhi is one area where people are looking at the cosmopolitan city, the national capital, politics of a different kind. We have Congress, we have BJP, and of course now the untested Aam Admi Party, which is threatening to, with its own level of campaign. How do you look at that? Looking at Delhi and looking at other states, as you commented on Delhi, let me respond to Delhi's situation first. I mean, like, uh, what is very interesting is that Delhi is one state, being the national capital, of course, where other, you know, usual electoral equations don't work as strongly as they do in the context of other states. For instance, caste and community and other considerations. So what is the major important plank that everybody seems to push forward? And that is development. Seen on this parameter, one would like to evaluate the government of Srimati Sheila Dixit in the last 15 years. And we all know that one way or the other, she has been someone who has been seen working seen working, creating conditions, creating infrastructure, etc., etc., though took a lot of drab during the Commonwealth Games. Having said that, look at Delhi. I mean, like the advantage in this election, to the extent that I can see, is the advantage Shira Dikshit, an advantage not uh, BJP, despite BJP's strong claim that state-level leadership is in the state of shambles. They seem to be fighting, 
and they don't have any parallel uh, program to offer. Contrary to that, Aam Admi Party seems to be more focused as to what they want to say, what they want to do, the kind of campaign they want to conduct. Is another thing that the, if anybody fears Aam Admi Party more than anybody else, it is uh, the BJP. Because they think that the BJP also took anti-corruption campaign in a big way and realized that Aam Admi Party has walked away with that kind of credit. So to that extent, that's the daily scenario. As far as the other states are concerned, I said, 2003 or 2008, so you have 2004 and you have 2009, we all know, I mean you would know it more than me, being a journalist, dealing with these issues on day-to-day basis, is that the state elections are a different cup of tea compared to national elections, because you see, now in 2013, a common voter is far too intelligent than what he or she was in 1952. I think intelligence-wise, we'll also say that they're more informed and easier access to information as compared to the voters of the previous generation. Because 77 elections showed Indian voter can think differently than what has been. Exactly. I mean, 77 is a watershed of uh, Indian political history. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Kaiser, one issue that we need to look at, obviously, in terms of elections itself, the conduct of elections, it's a huge and gigantic exercise. The election commission has rolled out of phase-wise in Chhattisgarh because that's where the Naxal affected region. But then other states, they're very comfortable with the one-day poll, whether it is Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Delhi, or Mizoram, all results coming on 8th. But I think one of the most significant things that happened in this election is the none of the above button which will be incorporated in the voting machine following the Supreme Court's order, the right to reject as it's known in popular terms. So that, do you think, should add to the numbers who would actually turn up at the voting polling station? Two things that I would like to say. What is uh, being described in uh, media journalistic uh, output, nota, none of the above. I think it's of course, is an option which is uh, given by the Supreme Court and uh, Election Commission has been campaigning for a very long time. In a way, there has been a systematic attempt on the part of the Election Commission particularly to cleanse Indian electoral politics of bad elements, criminal elements, undesirable elements. And the Apex Court has uh, time and again... And intervened and chipped in and in a way supported that idea and that has also been, you know, very strong expectation of the ordinary people like you and I. Now, remember, how does it work or how will it work, you know, when it comes to the crunch? They realize that your none of the above button will still not disqualify any of the candidates contesting that particular system. Exactly. So now anybody who gets the majority vote will still get elected irrespective of the percentage of vote or the, or the total quantum of vote. Yet it will act as a moral deterrent. It will act as a moral deterrent on candidates with dubious background to even think of contesting election. What if large number of people put that button, none of the above, then obviously know that these candidates are not good enough to even be considered as they are represented in a particular constituency. I think even uh, political parties which field candidates against whom there are many criminal cases because now Supreme Court affidavit, which is again a Supreme Court decision which makes you file affidavit compulsorily before you. And in fact, uh, this time again they have decided that the Election Commission announced that if affidavits which remain blank are liable to be rejected at the time of scrutiny. So which means you cannot escape because there must have certainly many of those election watchers have found out that certain data has a lacuna which needs to be corrected. But other important thing is uh, there has been a debate, there has been a lot of demand from many parties and then of course the PIL in the court was on this verifiable voters paper trail because several parties, be it the Telugu Desam, they had carried a whole campaign once upon a time against the electronic voting machines, suspecting that they could be manipulated. But of course, VVPT will not come through this time because of uh, technical issues or problems of production. How do you think? Looking at the working of the Election Commission of India, I think if I had any capacity, I would say that it should be given Nobel Peace Prize as an institution. Because in mind you, given the kind of size, diversity, difficult terrains, the number of polling booths, number of voters, number of manpower, including women power, being mobilized to conduct these elections, I think it's a... And in difficult circumstances too, like next areas. In exactly. It's a gigantic time. task. But the very fact that Election Commission has been doing a tremendous job, and let us all repose faith in the working of the Election Commission, and then accept 
the way things are. I mean, obviously, it's going to involve a lot of cost. It involves uh, involvement of technology and other things to ensure that every voter gets that. It can also make the voting exercise a little cumbersome. But then, if technically it is possible, why not? Go ahead uh, with this. Yeah, the commission said that the two public sector undertakings which are manufacturing machines do not have that kind of capacity to get everything. Some 10 lakh voting machines are required by the time you have general elections. And so I guess that will be some time down the line that we'll actually get onto it. I think Nagaland by election, there was a trial on this level. That brings me to the northeast state of Mizoram, which of course doesn't really figure very much in the national discussions, but it has a very important component when you mentioned the Mizo National Front and it has seen its government there. Congress was once upon a time a very strong party, but beyond this, the dynamics are different in that northeastern state? Yes, I think Mizo National Front uh, is a very interesting fact. I remember being a student, uh, you know, I remember the kind of accord which was signed, Rajiv Laldenga Accord, and that's the first time MNF accepted that the it is going to work within India's constitution. So, seen from that perspective, Congress and MNF uh, contesting for power in Mizoram, I think is a wonderful experience that one time one very hardcore secessionist organization came to mainstream. I would say it's a lesson for, for the rest of the country that finally, you know, like solution for complicated problems as complicated as Mizoram issue could be resolved by talking to each other. I'm quite happy that these two are the major contenders and no such element. Mizoram elections are by and large peaceful in the last uh, 20 years or more. And that way, yes, people have genuine aspirations, whichever side of the divide, whether the Congress and the MNF. And North East is no longer North East in a manner the way we used to think, say, 20 years ago. North East part of our mainstream with so many people from northeastern part of India having come to, you know, like Delhi, down south, Bombay, Pune, wherever they can go, either as workforce or as uh, professionals or as the students, I think no longer that far away. It is very much part of it as it has always been. Distance in terms of geographical distance cannot be cut short by any other way. But uh, to look at two more issues, I would club Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh together because they were one point of time, they were one state which became two in 2000. The politics largely remains limited between Congress and BJP. Of course, you have BSP here and there, which once upon a time in Madhya Pradesh was a formidable force. Yeah, in a way, if you see, Shri Shivraj Singh Chauhan has been there for two terms and he's contesting for the third term and so is the case with uh, the Chief Minister Raman Singh in Chhattisgarh. But I think somewhere along, the Congress will have to realize mistakes which it committed in different parts. Look at Raman Singh, people say that he has done very well as an administrator. Look at Shivraj Singh, he looks like a common man's Chief Minister in Madhya Pradesh. I mean, these two chief ministers do not appear as divisive force, divisive personality. So to that extent, you see that to contest power against Shivraj Singh, Chauhan and Raman Singh, I think is welcome. But then I think Chhattisgarh is far more intractable and difficult, given the kind of terrain, given the kind of political climate, because of the presence of Naxals, because of also the you know, the elimination of the top Congress leadership because of an slight attack on the Congress convoy, including uh, that old uh, Congress uh, leader Shuklaji, he passed away. So, Chhattisgarh, I th- I'm sure Congress has much uh, an appeal task. So, end of the day, it will be interesting to watch as the campaign picks up from now onwards because technically, the what is the model code of conduct comes into operation from the time the announcement is made. So, all announcements or grand freebies officially cannot be said anymore and we'll have to wait and see till December 8 what the ballot boxes throw up. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you. You are listening to a discussion on assembly elections in five states. The participants were Professor Rizwan Kaiser, Jamia Milia Islamia and K.V. Prasad, Associate Editor, The Tribune. It came to you in the program News Analysis produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. This program is also available on our website, newsonair.nic.in. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsdtalks at gmail.com.